My text this morning is one verse out of the book of Isaiah, chapter number 44, verse number 22. Some of you I know will want to turn there, so I'll be slow to start reading, and some of you I know will just want to listen. Isaiah, chapter 44, verse number 22. God is speaking. Isaiah is the spokesman, but God is speaking to the nation Israel. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Let me give you the local history there first. It, you know, I think it's rather obvious, but let me rehearse it just a minute. Israel was God's special people. He called them. Uh, they were the smallest. They were the most pathetic. They were a nation of slaves. But God chose the nation Israel as his own people. He made a covenant with them. And by the way, that was an eternal covenant. So was the land, Canaan, that God gave to them. That's not being fulfilled today. They're on a temporary hold, but yet it will be. Israel never lived up to their potential. They never lived up to their calling. They wandered from God and wandered from God and wandered from God. God sent prophet after prophet after prophet. And here is a verse, one of many, that God is calling His people back to Himself. That principle applies to all people all nations everywhere. We are not Israel, we're a church, we're not Jews, we're Gentiles, and there are some special promises to them that do not apply to anybody else, but the principle that people are walking away from God and God is calling people to Himself, that principle applies to all. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Now my text is really two words, same word in the twice, clouds. Clouds. We don't think anything about clouds, do we? Other than maybe ranchers and farmers who... I have to look and see what kind of work they can do today. Is it going to rain? Is it not going to rain? Uh, uh, is the going to cloud develop? Is it not? There's several kinds of clouds. I, I'm a real weather geek. I love the weather. Um, and, and so I love to watch the weather. And um, so the word God, God in the Bible uses a lot of physical things to teach a spiritual lesson. In my text, it's clouds. There is a similitude between a physical cloud and what it spiritually represents. Have you ever thought about King David? He did not have all this. He had only the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And when you read the Psalms, how in the world did he ever learn so much about God? And the answer is from nature. Now, there are some things nature cannot teach you. Grace, mercy, peace. Those are spiritual gifts that only the Holy Spirit can teach us. But David learned enormous amounts of information about God from nature. Now, David was a nature man. He was an outdoorsman. He, he was a sheep herder. 
Uh, he would rather be out in back 40 tending the sheep and strumming his guitar than have lunch with uh, the greatest preacher in town. David learned so much about God from natural observation. One of the uh, sad things about our modern society, our society is dealing with depression, mental illness, and suicide, it is epidemic in our country. You may not know this, but the old doctors and the old preachers and the old psychiatrists all believed there's nothing more therapeutic than long, slow walks in the country. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Now, I'm not making light. Some people have serious issues that it takes a doctor and it takes medicine. And I've always said, if you need to go to the doctor, go. If you need medicine, take the medicine. If you need surgery, get it done. But folks, we're suffering a lot from the modern lifestyle. The modern lifestyle is not a good lifestyle. God made nature. Man made cement. Amen. And, and I know in my own experience, boy, there's, when I get upset, when I get mad, when I get sick of people, when, and not y'all, people out there, not in here, uh, uh, I, 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 I find it so mentally peaceful to take long walks out of the country. I want to recommend that to you. I'm not a doctor, and this is not a doctor lecture, but... But, but folks, when you get enough of everything, take a long walk around the country and see what God's doing. It will comfort your heart. It will bring peace to your mind. Let me show you just a couple of things. What David learned about God from nature. Uh, first of all, I want you to go to Psalms 18. Psalms 18 and uh, I want you to begin at verse number 6, and, and it won't take me but a second to walk you through this. David was sorely hounded by Saul. His arm was trying to find him and kill him. So let's begin in verse 6 of Psalms 18. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills were moved and were shaken because he was wroth. What's that? It's an earthquake. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were skittled by it. What is that? It's a volcano. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. Have you ever noticed if a cloud, a, a cloud, a clouds can get so dark, you have to turn your headlights on the garden car. Storm. And he rode upon a chair and did fly. Yeah, he did fly by the wings of the wind. Storms, wind storms. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion around him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies, thunderstorms. At the brightness that was before him, thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire, hailstorms. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He shot out lightnings and discomforted them. Then the channels of the waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered. At thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils, he took from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. 
God, Paul learned from nature what God was able to do. One more place, and it, it's all of this psalm, but uh, turn to Psalms 147 for just a minute. Psalms 147. Let's just look from, say, verse 14 on. He maketh peace in thy borders and filleth thee with the finest of wheat. He sendeth forth his commandment upon earth. His word runneth very swiftly. He giveth snow like wool. He scattereth the hoarfrost like ashes. He casteth forth his ice like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? He sendeth out his word and melteth them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters flow. He showeth his word unto Jacob and statutes and judgments unto Israel. In every thing that God did, David in nature saw God, his power, his wisdom, his omnipotence, his majesty, his glory. Now the cloud. I blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. And as a cloud thy sins. What does the cloud teach us? Well, our sins are like clouds. Many and many kind. Clouds obstruct the light of the sun. Our sins hide us from God. Clouds cause shadows and darkness on the earth. Our sins cause trouble and anguish in our lives. Clouds are earthborn things, so are our troubles. When clouds are collected to the full, they bring forth storm and tempest. So our sins brings trouble and the storm into our lives. But there is one difference between the solemnitude of the cloud and sins. And the difference is this. Clouds sooner or later yield congenial, wonderful, helpful showers that bless the earth and bless man. But sins yield destruction. How can it be any other way? How can our souls be well? How can our lives be well? How can our nation be well? How can our churches be well? How can our land be well? As long as the clouds of sin remain. Because God said the wages of sin is death. Well, if that was all to the verse, this would be a sad sermon. But it's not. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. But now look, return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. There is hope with God. God never throws us away. God is always there for us. The, the, half, the first half of the verse would be hopeless, but the other half of the verse gives us hope. I want you to notice, first of all, the notable act of God's mercy. The notable act of God's mercy. I have blotted out. Think of what this nation did to God. They went into idolatry. Uh, they rebelled against Him. They threw His word away. Uh, they told God to go mind His own business. A lot of what's going on in our nation right now is exactly what Israel did, but God never gave up on them. Finally, he did say, that's enough, they're going into captivity, but he'll pick them up again. And so that's what God deals with sometimes. He, he blesses us, he deals us, and we walk away, and, and sometimes he has to punish us for that, but he does not throw us away. At some point in time, he'll blot out our sins, and he'll renew our lives. I have blotted it out. At Israel's worst time, God came on the scene, not in anger, but in mercy. 
And so for us, Hebrews 4.16, mm -hmm. let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. He blocks the clouds out of existence. So he does our sins. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. The work of Jesus Christ on the cross took our sins completely away. Titus chapter number 2 Beginning in verse number 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Twice, in Colossians 2.14 and in Acts 3.19, when talking about our sins, God uses the word blotted out. How many of you here are old enough to remember blotters? Remember you used to write yeah. real rain and you had to blot them because if you did you oh we should give them our age away early. God completely wipes them out. What sin are we talking about? As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. What can wash away our sins? The psalm says. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The notable act of God's mercy. And then, I want you to notice secondly, in this scenario of the cloud, the gracious command, return unto me. Return unto me. Not to be judged, but to be forgiven and restored and blessed. Why should pardon sinners live at a distance from God? Makes no sense. Having therefore brethren boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having in a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. God said to Israel by the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 2, first he said, your own black backslidings have destroyed you. But then in verse 19 he says, come to me and I will heal your backslidings. And no Christian has to stay in a backslid condition. God is yearning for your fellowship to come back to him. Somebody may think, well, I know what I've done. No, I don't, and it's a good thing I don't, and I don't need to know, neither does anybody else. That's between you and the Lord. But listen to this. In Isaiah 1.18, come now, God says, let us reason together. Though your sins be scarlet, they be white as snow, they, they be crimson, they shall be as wool. In Revelation Chapter 2 and 3, God deals with the churches. And, and, and by the way, there, there's never been a perfect church. The first church that ever was, the church of Jerusalem, they had a bushel full of problems. There's no such thing as a perfect church. You know why? Because it's made up of people who are imperfect. The old quib, slang, saying, you ever find a perfect church, don't join it, because if you do, it won't be perfect anymore. And, and by, by, by 90 AD, the Lord wrote seven rebuking, uh, uh, instructive letters to seven literal churches. And they had all kinds of problems. But 
God said two things to the three things to those churches. Number one, he said, I've got the messengers of your churches in my hand. I'm in God's hand. God takes care of me. Secondly, he said, I walk in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. What was that? That's the churches. We are light. And folks, if we ever quit being light in this community, we're done for. We're light. And then he said, thirdly, let this, let he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let God speak to us. Because what he's saying is, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open up, I will come in and sup with him. What does that mean? Fellowship. Fellowship. Communion. And fellowship. And let me make one more application. And that's if somebody's here that does not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. The wages of sin is death. The Bible says, he that believeth not is condemned. But the Bible says, we must go to him. We must submit to him. We must confess our sins. We must receive him. And he will. He will. Listen to the verse one more time. Isaiah 44, 22. I have brought blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. And as a cloud thy sins, return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. I lived for many years in New Mexico. And I love it out there, and I love it, and I still do, especially the mountains. But there was a strange thing, a strange weather phenomenon over the desert southwest. It would cloud up dark springtime dark, or well, the summer monsoon seasons, dark, thick, black clouds, and it looked like any minute the sky was going to open up and it'd be a terrible storm. And 15 minutes later, you look up, and they're gone. <coughs> Over the desert, there wasn't the moisture and the atmospheric correctness to really make those into real thunderclouds and real rain clouds. That's what God will do in your life if you let him. You may be living under a terrible cloud of darkness brought on by misment living in sin. But God can make that cloud go away. He'll blot it out. I've been singing it to myself so much, this little song of revive us again. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Thine be the glory, O oh Lord. Revive us again. Amen. Amen. Would you stand, please? <coughs> with every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm just going to sing a verse of the song. And if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, then you need to respond uh, by receiving Christ, by coming to the church. If you need prayer, you can come to this altar and pray. You can, I can pray for you anywhere we can help you. Our precious Father, bless this invitation. Lord, take the words, take the message that you've laid on my heart and apply it to the hearts and minds of the people. Especially this message I know was especially for one or more that only you know about. Bless this message to the heart of the hearers and let us respond accordingly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing number, number 123. Let's sing. <laughs>